friends, and welcome to episode 449 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is the 22nd installment in the Diabetes Pro Tip series. The Pro Tip episodes began way back at episode 210 and obviously have happened 21 times prior to this one. If you'd like to see all of those episodes in one place, you can actually go to diabetesprotip.com. They're all right there. Or at juiceboxpodcast.com, you scroll down a little bit to where it says pro tip episodes, and you can scroll through them there. The episodes, of course, are also available in any podcast player that you listen to. Now, each one of these episodes has one thing in common. My friend, Jenny Smith. Jenny is a CDE who has had type 1 diabetes for over 30 years. She holds a bachelor's degree in human nutrition and biology from the University of Wisconsin, Jenny is a registered and licensed dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, and a certified trainer on most makes and models of insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring systems. She is also pretty much the only person I ask diabetes questions to, and I love her in these episodes. At the end of this episode, which by the way, if you're a person who's like, oh, I'm never going to have a baby or I'm a boy or whatever it is you're thinking right now, postpartum doesn't apply to me. These diabetes pro tip episodes are, I think, terrific, and I think they all go together. There's a lot to learn from listening to this episode because at its essence, it's dealing with huge variables, which is what you'll find after you've had a baby. So it doesn't apply, but it does. You'll see. At the end of this episode, I'll tell you where you can find Jenny. I'll tell you where the rest of the pro tip episodes are and what the topics are. And uh, anyway, I think you should listen to this one, whether you're going to have a baby or not. Please remember while you listen that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. And last thing, this episode of the Juice Box podcast is sponsored by the Omnipod Tubeless Insulin Pump. Go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box to get yourself a free, no-obligation demo of the Omnipod or to see if you're eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. Ooh, 30 days, free. You heard me. MyOmnipod.com forward slash juice box. Go check it out. The podcast is also sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter, the most easy-to-use, easy-to-carry, accurate meter that my daughter has ever held, owned, or used. Contour Next dot com forward slash juice box. Get yourself that contour next one. All right. Well, that took three minutes, which is probably two minutes longer than it took most of you to get pregnant. So here's Jenny. Ba-dum-bump. As time passes, I'm becoming more and more aware of a lot of pregnant women or women who want to get pregnant, who have type one diabetes, who are listening to the show and who are um, enjoying, like there's a series back in the show with Samantha, where I interviewed her every three months, like during her pregnancy. Yeah, I remember you mentioning yeah. her. And that apparently um, is making the rounds on the on the internet and the way people listen to things. And um, I just get a number of emails, and I'm sure you do as well, that are either, that start off with like, I can't, I'm never going to be able to get pregnant because I can't get myself together. And then they go, I can't believe I did it or I'm doing it, you know, like that kind of a thing. Um, but then there's that, the the rest of it that I guess we stop thinking about because the baby's out. <laughs> like, and I don't know, that's, right. that's weird. So a person in my mind, being a person who's never been pregnant and doesn't have type one, that journey seems painfully taxing to me from going from not thinking you'll be ever, ever be able to have a baby to figuring it out, to then doing it, to having these insanely great A1Cs while you're pregnant. And I don't know, it just feels like it would be super simple to just not abandon it, but lose sight of it after you have the baby because of all the things that happen after that. Um, so right. I, and I, I don't think it's that, um, I don't think it's that the good majority of women really think that they're just going to just give it all like all the work that I've put in over the past, you know, nine to maybe 12 months, if they really did a lot of really good preconception management to kind of get there and managed, it could have been a long haul mm -hmm. of, you know, 
nine to 18 months, let's call it, of trying to really strategically nail things down. But, and I don't think that if you've done that, or even if you've come into pregnancy, maybe not where you wanted, but you really did an awesome job of mastering things and getting things taken care of through the pregnancy. By the end of pregnancy, most women aren't like, oh, I'm just going to like throw it all in the basket, everything I learned how to do. But there is a big piece postpartum that especially as a first time mother is completely a hundred percent new. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is, it's like being thrown into like a new job in a country where you don't speak the language. And they're like, here you go. It's all yours to like figure it out. And by the so, way, the job will die if you drop it or right. leave it on the exactly. Yeah. Or you're, you're going to kill a million people if you don't do it exactly the right way. Well, it is how it feels, isn't it? That's kind of what it is postpartum. I think a lot of the, a lot of the up down comes in because you're trying to manage something a hundred percent new, or the hormones that shift and change after you deliver can be a roller coaster of effect. And for, I mean, I usually say in a general sense, the first three months post delivery is going to be kind of a rollery up and down, mainly because, especially if you're nursing or pumping to feed your child, okay. the shift in hormones and the shift in how much you're nursing, how much you're pumping can drive things the opposite way that you would think that they might which makes it very difficult to establish. I would have usually like over bolus for this, or I would have usually been really aggressive to nail down this now climbing blood sugar, but Oh, I'm going to nurse in the next 15 minutes. So I really can't do this strategy Mm -hmm. because otherwise I'm going to tank. So there's a lot that changes postpartum. Okay. So not only so there are some people who enter pregnancy and already have that A1C that they need. But mm-hmm. um, but despite that, whether you're a person who had to get there or you were there already, once you're pregnant, your insulin needs, they drastically change. I know it's not like trimester to trimester exactly, right? But there are times when you don't need as much as you think and times when you need so much more that it's hard to imagine how much more you need. Right. Right. So now you have that in your head. You've been pregnant. You're, you're having breakfast that prior to pregnancy took three units, during pregnancy took 12 units, and now you've, you're holding the baby. And you're thinking, is this 12 units? Is it three units? Why does the weight of the world feel like it's on my shoulders? Like, you know, am I nursing? All this stuff comes together, and how do you do that? It's, so you started by saying the h- hormones. and. Mm-hmm. I I only want to spend a second on this, but, you know, I'm older and growing up, it doesn't happen much anymore. Like society has really shifted, you know, in the way people are towards each other. And that might be harder for like somebody in their mid 20s to believe. But when 30 years ago, you know, stuff that you think of as a joke now is actually how people would think about women sometimes like, oh, you know, she gets upset or, you know, what time of the month it is or that kind of thing. Not giving any like credence to the idea that when your hormones are jumping around, it's really difficult to deal with. And and, right. And, and that women are in a particularly vulnerable situation because of that. So how you feel from a hormonal shift could be physically. It also could mean your, your clarity. And I think what you said is just really important to remember, especially for first time mothers, when you have a baby and they give it to you, it it does genuinely feel like someone just told you that the the fate of the world rests in your hands and <laughs> you don't understand what to do. But if you mess it up for certain, the universe won't exist anymore. It really feels like that. And some people have really awesome babies that are like the easiest. They just, they sleep when you'd expect that they nurse beautifully. They sleep again. Like they don't have any like major poop problems. <laughs> like, you know, you just have this, like what you would call, like, I have no trouble with my, my perfect baby. Yeah. blah blah blah. And then there are women who just don't like some kids are just not, They're not that easy. type of an infant as a newborn. And I think when you have diabetes too, then it brings in 
management again of something that's completely new. I don't know, should I do this? Should I try this? Is the doctor right? You know, am I going to do this wrong to my child? Blah, blah, blah. And then there's diabetes in the picture yeah. and the timing of insulin and the timing of adjusting and remembering to change your pump site or to actually take your basal insulin injection. I mean, there's a world of scheduling difference that comes into the picture mm-hmm. postpartum. And, and I would imagine too, and this is just me imagining, but if you've lived for nine months with an A1C and like the low fives, there's got to be a part of you as a type one is just like, wow, I want this for the rest of my life too. Right. And now you feel like if it's going away, now it's another failure on top of, I don't understand why this baby throws up all the time or, you, you know, like, I, you know, I'm sure people are like, oh, yeah, like I've everyone's heard the joke about like the baby peed on me one time. Yeah, that's fine. My son couldn't hold down food for months until we figured out what to give him. And yeah. and it, it, the culmination of it was quite honestly, Kelly holding him at her grandfather's funeral. When basically it felt like somebody took a half a gallon of spoiled milk and dumped it on Kelly because it just came out of him like that at a funeral. And she had only been a mom for a little time. And it's hard. And so it's fun to talk about like, oh, the baby peed on me or it throws up all the time. But sometimes (laughs) it throws up at a funeral (laughs) and and you're hormonal and your grandfather's dead. (laughs) And and now your CGM is going off because your blood sugar is skyrocketing because you're stressed out about said incident. Yep. And that's what I was going to say. My wife didn't have type one diabetes. So then all that other stuff that goes on top of it. So, so What do you, so is it similar? Like, could you sit down and make a flow chart? Is it similar for people at, at least at some core level, or is it going to be different for every woman? There are similarities as, you know, we talk about in our, in my, the pregnancy book that I Mm -hmm. co-wrote. It's, there is enough similarity, just like in pregnancy. I mean, everybody's going to have some shifts and changes that are a little bit different, very specific to you, just like diabetes is very specific person to person. But postpartum, yes. I mean, the transition typically, as soon as you have delivered and the placenta has been delivered as well, it's it's like the placenta, which is the major like functional hormonal unit. Once that's gone and baby is out, the hormone shift is like a drop off a cliff. It's wow. like it's gone fast, Mm -hmm. which is the reason that we usually say, based on where you were at this point in pregnancy, just before delivery, in terms of insulin use, if you didn't know where you were pre-pregnancy, so you could see how much things shifted up by the end of pregnancy, then we usually recommend adjusting basal rates down by about 50%. Wow. Okay. That's the, that's expected. I, it, could be a little less, it could be a little bit more person to person again may differ, but that's a baseline adjustment. So if you've never been told what to do and nobody's directing very well, expect that postpartum, you should cut your basils by 50%. Another really good idea is to, most women know when their due date is. (laughs) So if you're using an insulin pump, especially set up a profile that's called postpartum. Okay. Because as soon as you deliver, all you have to enable to do is enable that. Wow, Just, that's that was going to be my question. Like you're saying, like placenta comes out, you take a deep breath and go, "I need my pump right now," <laughs> and and that's it, fifty percent less. Fifty percent less. Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, so that placenta is. Please forgive me if this is ham fisted, but it's the it's the equivalent of a giant sausage cheese pizza sitting in your stomach that somebody just reaches in and takes out all of a sudden, and now you don't have that impact anymore. Correct. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a placenta, but it is very close to a cheese pizza when you look at it. <laughs> they're, they're very interesting um, organs. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, and the, the cool thing is that your body creates it for one purpose and then it's gone. It's not like your heart, which is like, you know, it's always there for your whole entire life. It's like your body makes this thing just like it makes the baby. And then, Oh, it's all done. It's only got this like nine month life. And that's it. I was just thinking this. I It's funny you said that because I was just thinking the same thing. Like, why can't we just tell our body to make another heart? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I mean, if it can nice. do that, it could at least, you know, vacuum or something. You know, It just could at least vacuum. also make another pancreas, man, if we can make it right. Well, I mean, why not? I'm not a doctor, but somebody should get on that. <laughs> I entirely agree. <laughs> You imagine if you just had a panel on your back and you flipped a switch and that nine months later, your body just spit out an organ. Yes. 
<laughs> there you exactly. go. Exactly. At a little slot on your side. I don't know why this is impossible. Probably because of science, but nevertheless. <laughs> okay, so uh, baby comes out. We're all like oohing and on, taking those weird bloody pictures that people take in the beginning and everything. And then I change my basal rate. What am I going to see next? My bo- Does the body begin making milk at birth or does it even start prior to that? So you've decided that you want an insulin pump. You've decided that you don't want it to be tubed. Now you're going to get yourself an Omnipod. I think that's a good move. But there's more that can help you make your decision. Two things can happen when you go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. You can ask Omnipod to send you a free, no obligation, non-working demo of the Omnipod. That's called a pod experience kit. They'll send you out a pod that you can wear to see how you feel about it. But you can also check on your eligibility for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash system, right? This is an actual usage trial. You can use the Omnipod Dash for 30 days if you're eligible for this. And you'll be able to find out about your eligibility or ask for your pod experience kit at myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. It is super simple to do, will only take you a couple of moments. And the next thing you know, whether you're a type one or a type two using insulin, you're gonna be able to find out what it's like to have that Omnipod. The insulin pump that my daughter has been using since she was four years old, and in a couple of months, she's going to be 17. For 13 years, Arden has been wearing an Omnipod every day. And I promise you, it has been a friend in this journey like no other. So why don't you find out if tubeless insulin pumping is for you, myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. There are links in your show notes right there in your podcast player or at juiceboxpodcast.com. When you use my link, you're supporting the show, myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. Give it a try. There's literally nothing to lose. There's no downside to this. Have that no obligation demo pod sent to you or check into that 30 day free trial of the dash. See if you're eligible. Here's one more no-brainer for you. The Contour Next One blood glucose meter. ContourNext.com forward slash juice box. I clicked it on there myself just now. Clicked it on there. That was my fancy word for typing. I just brought up the website here. Jeez, sorry. I just brought up that link right now. ContourNext.com forward slash juice box. Because there's so much here that's good for you. I can't remember it all when I'm making this ad. You get there. There's a list of their products. They have resources like the Contour Diabetes app and a blood sugar log book for downloading. But there's also the possibility that you can get a Contour Next One meter for free. You go to meters and strip savings and you click on free Contour Next One meter to see if you're eligible. They have test strip saving programs. It's it's also there under that tab. And it's incredibly possible that a Contour Next One meter could be cheaper out of pocket then you're paying now through insurance for another meter. Now, maybe it won't be. Maybe it's going to be better for you to go through insurance. Maybe not. But there's that possibility. And you can check into it at contournext.com forward slash juice box. Why am I telling you to do this? Because this meter is the most accurate meter Arden has ever used. It has second chance test strips, meaning you can touch the blood, not get enough, go back, get the right amount without wasting a test strip, and you still get that accurate test. That's just amazing. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. In the past, I never thought about the meter Arden had, but now I do. Not only do you deserve one that's accurate and easy to use and easy to carry that has a bright light, but your management will thank you because having accurate data is the best way to make good decisions. The way that it should happen, again, everybody's Mm -hmm. a little different in what happens, Um, but what should happen is a a first milk is created. It's called colostrum. Mm -hmm. And essentially, that's very short-lived in production before milk comes in. It could be a short-lived, you know, few days. It could be 24 hours before your milk comes in. Um, But that milk is a very, like, 
it's very simple form of nutrition for the baby. It's kind of what the baby is in need of right here and now. And there's not much of it. So it's not like if you were to pump it, you're going to get like six ounces of it. Mm -hmm. it's not, that's just not what you would get, right? Um, so, but in that simple form and with the loss of the pregnancy hormones, now you have this sensitized system that was resistant leading up to this point. Mm -hmm. And so therein also lies some mental shift, the shift of, you know, nearing the end of pregnancy coming, you know, pre bolus isn't 15 minutes, it's sometimes 45 minutes by the end of pregnancy, in order to have good flat after meal blood sugars. Well, now you have to completely flip that switch. And it's back to maybe I need 10 minutes, maybe I need no pre bolus in the early couple of weeks post delivery. Mm -hmm. So not only is it that your basal shifts, but it's also that your ratios shift your insulin to carb, your correction factor, your pre-bolus time. So there's there's a major transition. Right. You just become a completely different pe person with type 1 diabetes just like that. And right. and so is it similar to but more drastic to ha getting your period like being that like there's that, you know what I mean? I don't know if it works for everybody, but Arden's three sometime now that she's on birth control she's more like two different people during the month but um and, and the and it can be it's drastic for us you know she can go from mm -hmm. a unit an hour to two units an hour basal depending mm -hmm. on what time of the month it is and it does but it doesn't flip like a switch it's not like but i can see it happen happens over hours and maybe a day, but it doesn't happen. It's not like at three o'clock, she's like, I just got my period and everything changes immediately. Right. But is it that just blown up much more? Because I mean, what are you really talking about? So for people who don't know, like it, I go into pregnancy, I just said, I, I go into, let's just say I'm pregnant. <laughs> All right. I'm pregnant. I have type one diabetes. Let's see if you're a lady with long curly hair. <laughs> I'm a lady. I have type one diabetes. I get pregnant. My basal rate is 1.5 an hour. In the first trimester, is it how much does it go up? A lot. In the early weeks, typically, we a good round estimate is if you know the percent of increase you've had in the days before your cycle starts, if you've taken enough notice and you have a rise and you offset it by a percent of temp basal or an extra basal dose or whatnot, you can expect those early weeks of pregnancy, typically up to about six, seven, eight weeks, mm -hmm. that you're going to have an increase in insulin need that's pretty similar. It might be more dramatic than that. It may be less, but you're going to have a ramp bump as your body is increasing its production of now pregnancy hormones to sustain the pregnancy in furthering along. Okay. So I should have said my, my bolus was one so that we could keep track, right? It, say I'm one. Usually when I get my period, I'm two. So then we're going to say in the first six to eight weeks of pregnancy, I'm probably going to be more like two, more like I have my period. Correct. Ish exactly. in there. Right. And then from there, it goes, it goes up again. So end of first trimester, most women notice either a plateau okay, um, or they notice a bit of a dip off in their insulin needs come back down. for just that end of the first trimester. Usually we say on average, it's about, it starts at about eight weeks, goes through about 12, maybe even 14, 14 weeks, which is that ver very early second trimester start time period okay. of sensitivity. You may have needed to back off of your pre bolus time again, a little bit. You may have gone down slightly in your baseline basal needs, um, just more sensitivity around meal boluses and kind of almost feeling like things have sort of stabilized. Like mm -hmm. you have a little bit more wiggle room, like I could eat three chips in between and not actually bolus for it because it doesn't seem to do anything. To right. Me. Right. Or right. Um, and then second trimester, again, a little bit of a nudge up potentially in early second trimester, but a little bit more stability up until about 18 weeks, 18 to 20 weeks. Um, we kind of refer to it as the the slow roller coaster climb. So if you imagine you're at the bottom of the roller coaster to begin with, mm -hmm. and now around 18 to 20 weeks, you start that slow, like click, click, click up the roller coaster hill. Yep. And that kind of progresses. You increase in resistance 
along the way, all the way up until about 35, 36 ish weeks. Just a steady climb. It's a steady climb. And initially in the second trimester, it's on average expect to make some tweaks to things about every two weeks, give or take. Gotcha. Um, in basal, as well as insulin to carb ratio, as well as the pre bolus time continues to lengthen, um, your correction factor may need to get more aggressive. But usually by the beginning of the third trimester, mm-hmm. that's the most resistant time. Okay. Uh, and up and through like 34 to 36 weeks. As you're talking, I'm literally, I have a piece of paper in front of me and I'm just kind of moving a pen as you're talking, like trying to make a graph of what to understand. And especially now it's going to grow up every two weeks. So I know this isn't mathematical and I'm not telling anybody that if you started right. with one unit the day before you got pregnant, but where can somebody end up who started at one unit an hour? Where could they end up at 35 weeks? So insulin needs on average, double or triple from pre-pregnancy to the end of pregnancy, or what we would consider just pre-delivery time, which is about by 36 weeks. By 36 weeks, we reach again this sort of like plateau place Mm -hmm. where again, some sensitivity can start to come back. Some women's basal needs start to dip off just slightly, shouldn't be aggressive or heavy. Um, In fact, it's a time period that if you are having aggressive changes in in your insulin in terms of like drops in need, um, it's a time to check in with your provider. Um, Some of it can be relevant to placental failure. And so it's a time, again, if things change drastically that you would check in, but otherwise it's expected. A little bit of a nudge down, a little bit of increase in sensitivity kind of creep back in before you actually deliver. Um, But on average, you know, how much to adjust? Like I said, most women either double or triple their needs from pre to about that 36 week point. And so now you have the baby, And you could be going from this mindset, I'm three units an hour, back to one. Yeah, back to one all of a sudden. Exactly. And on top of that, all the sensitivity around meals has changed. And and you're telling me nursing is going to drop the blood sugar? Nursing for most women who have good milk supply and are able to, you know, pump or nurse completely without, you know, most women experience, especially in the early weeks, usually about the first eight to 12 ish weeks post delivery, notice some shifts down in glucose after nursing during or after if, if your child nurses for a lengthy period of time, you could notice it during the nursing session itself. Um, some women notice it only at certain times of day. Mm-hmm versus the whole day, you know, having to consistently pay attention every nursing session, they're eating, you know, like two glucose tablets or having half a juice box or something like that. Um, I mean, our recommendations are once you, once you're a few weeks out from delivery, kind of baby by that point has some typical sleep, wake, poop, kind of patterns, you're probably still nursing about every three-ish hours, maybe a little lengthier overnight, as long as your baby's nursing well during the day Mm -hmm. um, or feeding well during the day. But, you know, most often if you're going to nurse in the aftermath of a meal, a good recommendation is to take the bolus dose down or count carbs, but underdose by, you know, 25%. So it's dramatic enough that if I eat, I keep saying I, if, if, the, <laughs> if the lady eats before nursing, that meal won't need as much insulin because you're going to need some of that meal. So that means if you're not planning on eating and you're going to nurse, you need to eat something going into the nursing. Typically going into nursing or during the nursing session to prevent a low. Um, yes. And it could be anywhere. It could be simple. It could be five grams of carb. It could be as much as 15 grams of carb. Yeah. It just depends. And that's where, you know, looking at things like insulin on board. Yeah, you might not be bolusing and nursing directly after, but if it's still like within two or three hours after you bolused, you still have some active insulin from that bolus. And we tell people, at least I I say, and I know I feel like you agree, having active insulin while you're exercising is a pretty sure way to make yourself low. But, and so I'd want to avoid active insulin during nursing as well. Or plan for it with a snack. Or plan for it with snack. And the other thing is there too if you can go negative insulin um, and get through exercise without dropping, you can't do that with nursing though. So nursing's more 
taxing on your body than some forms of exercise? Is that fair? Like, is there a correlation um, to think about it in there or no? I guess there's some relation to think about it. I think, um, like I think I always think of overnight, right. Where for the most part, moms, dads, they're tired at night with a newborn. Mm -hmm. Many people are. Um, and if that's the case, you're likely going to bed at like nine o'clock, like you nurse your child and you're like, okay, I'm going to sleep because I'm going to be up again at like midnight, one o'clock to do this all over again. You may have eaten dinner at like seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. You're going to bed. Well, you're well into basal insulin by let's call it 11 PM. Right. So anytime you're going to nurse after that, and you're only on basal, and I experienced this myself for both my kids, basal overnight, if I, even if I had it at all, and my basils while I was nursing kids overnight in those early months, it was like near nothing. Mm -hmm. My basil was like 0 0.2, 0 0.25 overnight. Wow. It was already down to almost nothing. And if I nursed and didn't still have something minimal, like I actually made these, um, what are called like lactation cookies. They're made with like oats and flax and peanut butter and stuff that helps with lactation, blah, blah, blah. But I made them so they were each about five grams of carb. But they were nice because I could eat it. It had some stability to it. It wasn't just pure glucose. Mm -hmm. So it had some stability. And so I'd usually eat it as soon as I started nursing or something like trail mix, some nuts and seeds with a little bit of like dried fruit in it. Something that was no more than about five or 10 grams of carb. And that helped with the stability component with rather than the a nose diet. Well, and so this is another time, you know, where the the food choices you make are going to make things easier for you too. You, you can't, yeah. and you know, so it's gonna you're gonna have a different scenario going into nursing if you're like, hey, I know what to do. I'll have a handful of this and a little bit of that, and that's gonna work out perfectly. But on Thursday. When you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have ice cream before I nurse. There's going to be diff all everything about ice cream still exists there and your diabetes. Right. Okay. In fact, those kinds of things, you know, as we know, ice cream typically should cause a bit of a rise, possibly later fat, dependent mm -hmm. on how much of you ate, you know, two spoonfuls, probably not, but like the whole yeah. you know, pint of it probably. <laughs> so. so you're telling me that there's a, a, a way that I can get, I can have ice cream far enough out in the future ahead of my nursing where I could balance that fat rise against the nursing. <laughs> you know, there are some lunatics that listen to this podcast that are going to try that. I saw somebody online this morning who's trying to stay hundred percent in range till they get to their endos appointment and they're doing it. <laughs> and I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, that's a lot of, um, they, I mean, that's, yeah, I don't know. I don't do that. So I, um, for Arden, I, I think um, it, they just get they they got a little like. Uh, I just wanted to see if more they could power do it. to them. That's I what I, I want to tell people too. I it, no, it sounds difficult in the beginning to have a baby, but if you want to know how good you will get at it at some point, here's a great example. About two minutes ago, there was a bang in Jenny's house that was so loud. I thought the world was coming to end. <laughs> she didn't flinch. She didn't stop talking. It was, it, 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 that's what happens. You, eventually, you just become a steely eyed missile man. She just did not move. She's just well, like, because there are bangs all day in my house. I mean, when you work, you know, from your own home office and you have children in your home, I'm sure there will be more bangs. I don't know what they're doing upstairs, but they are having fun. It was, so it was just a great example of how you do become really great <laughs> at parenting after you've had kids for a while. I swear to you, you did resilience. Not, I don't need it, it's almost like you didn't hear it. <laughs> just don't pay attention. Sometimes, oh my gosh, sometimes like. The, like I have a big sign mm -hmm. that my husband made for me and it's outside my office door. And one side says quiet zone. Mommy is working. And the other side is mommy is done. You may enter and be loud is right. what it says. Well, you know, when I'm working, it's still always in the quiet zone. Well, you know, with an eight and a four year old, they know what the sign says, but that doesn't always still click yeah. into place. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it does not overwhelm what they want in their hearts at that moment. That's for no. sure. No, I um, listen, Arden's that's funny. Arden's going to be 17 in a couple of months. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And I saw her go into where my wife was working the other day. She looked at me like she was six, like, hey, watch this slides into Kelly's chair, sits on top of her and goes, mom, can you rub my head? And <laughs> Kelly's like, you know, reaching around for the keyboard and everything. So it right. will it will you won't always feel 
overwhelmed. How many no. people do you, th- I, I don't, I'm not going to say how many people, but I mean, do you see women generally able to stick to their diabetes goals after pregnancy or should they expect it's going to get out of whack and they're going to have to do some work to get it back? Like, how does that usually go? I, I see that you should expect that there's going to be fluctuation that you will have to learn to adjust to. Mm -hmm. I, I myself, I had to learn to adjust because, you know, as much as I know clinically and professionally, the experience itself speaks volumes about what you need to transition through. And um, so I think every woman postpartum should expect that things are going to be a little bit wonkier for a bit of time. Um, I mean, some things that I think helped me transition were I prepped some meals and froze them Mm -hmm. prior to baby coming, you know, and whether you have diabetes or not, that can be really, really helpful. You know, um, some of those kinds of things. I also had snacks planned. I had, I mean, while you end up sometimes nursing your child, wherever is comfortable, Mm -hmm. um, you know, planned places, you know, in the baby's room, in your bedroom, in a comfy chair in the living room, just some things that were like easily reachable that I didn't have to like call to somebody to bring me. And I just had glucose tablets and some juice boxes, some like trail mix and that kind of stuff sort of set multiple places around. So, I mean, there's some planning that you can do ahead of time, but the diabetes management piece of it, you kind of learn it as you go. I mean, I'd say that about the women that I work with through pregnancy, if I had to estimate, I'd say about 50% of them end up sort of sticking with me a little bit longer postpartum just because, especially the, the new moms, you know, ones that already have one or two kids, they're like, ah, yeah. I think I got this, you know? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> so does being pregnant with type one give you an advanced? So what do I want to say here? There are so many times when I'm making this podcast that it occurs to me that success with diabetes hinges a a good deal on your desire to be successful and your ability to feed that desire with effort. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so you, you you get pregnant and then it becomes like this thing we were talking about in the beginning, like this, uh, this feeling that you are in charge of the universe all of a sudden. And I will tell you too, and I mention it sometimes when I talk to adults who didn't have particularly well managed like teen years or whatever, a lot of them have a through line. They started to care more about themselves or they started caring more about another person. Like they want, and then they wanted to be healthier because they wanted to be in this relationship or because they wanted to go to do something or, um, and the baby falls in that category to me. Like I want to, I'm going to do this so that the baby can be healthy. And the, the number of women that I've talked to who were living really unmanaged lives with type one diabetes, And then are all of a sudden 4.8 A1Cs, you you know what I mean? And eating like a lot because they're growing a baby. It happens. I I just see it a lot. And so Mm -hmm. I always kind of think personally as a person who's never going to have a baby and hopefully never have type 1 diabetes, there's something about that motivation in there that, that I guess the fight in postpartum is to not, and I don't know if it's something you can stop, but for all these things that are going to happen to you postpartum to try to still whittle out a little bit of your energy or effort to devote to your blood sugar. Absolutely. And I think a good reason there too, in terms of diabetes postpartum is glucose management still translates into that time period for the sake of the child, even though they're no longer growing Mm -hmm. in you and your blood sugars aren't as direct of an impact postpartum, if you are nursing and you are not managing your glucose as optimally as, you know, would be helpful, those higher glucose levels are going to impair your ability to make enough milk. Okay. If left high, your ability will be decreased. 
You will also be more dehydrated as you nurse. It takes fluid out of you if you're not putting it back and glucose levels are also trending high. That in and of itself is also going to make your glucose management more difficult. Does it change the um, milk itself? To, to a degree. I mean, years ago, we don't, we don't talk about this really much anymore. Um, although I have heard some women who've asked me, should I just, you know, pump when I'm really, really high and then dump it because I've been told that that high sugar milk is really bad for my baby. I mean, overall increment of right now, my blood sugar is high because I ate something and didn't really have the right carb count and I'm knocking it down. Should I not feed my hungry child right now? Absolutely not. Go ahead, feed your child, nurse your child, pump, right. whatever. Don't get rid of the milk. Your body works really hard to make that milk. Don't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But the goal is to have more sustained levels that are still in target. So, so you're able to continue to make milk mm -hmm. and that the amount of milk sugar that's in that, that breast milk is stable, right? That it's stable and at the level that it's supposed to be protein, fat, carb content of milk changes as the milk, as the baby's kind of needs change through the growth cycle. Yeah. So you want that amount of natural carb in there to be appropriate. If you're sustaining blood sugars, you know, well above 180, you can guarantee that your milk is richer in carb, not by like loads and gallons, mm -hmm. but overall you're supplying your child with bits more carb and in a tiny growing body, a little bit can be a lot. Okay. That's, it just occurred to me, like we talk about undiagnosed people can, um, their urine can smell sweet or their breath can smell sweet. I was like, I wonder if it could happen to the milk too. That makes sense. So, uh, uh, much like most of this about diabetes, sustaining low variability is always just very important. No bouncing around, you know, that kind of thing. But if you just threw, like, say you were a person who had the baby and was just like, boom, I'm going back to my 9A1C, th that milk would be tainted in some way. Not, yes. Yeah. It's not perfect, is what we're saying. Okay. It's not perfect. Right. right. I mean, and, you know, is any milk perfect? I don't know. But yeah. I mean, if you're sustained, if you're sustaining these really elevated glucose levels, that's not a benefit. And you're going to, I mean, for the most part, you're going to have difficulty maintaining milk the production. Supply. You are. It made me wonder when you were talking about long term. What about people who I, you know, sometimes you see people like nursing a two year old. So it, it, for people who do that, should they expect that that hit like your body never gets used to that right like you're going to get that Nursing? blood yeah that blood sugar hit's going to come forever if you no matter not how really no actually Wait no in fact after about 3 to 4 months postpartum there's a stable enough nature to the milk supply and to what your body or your baby is demanding um <clears throat> that for the most part things stabilize wow. a lot easier after about three to four months. Um, in fact, I nursed my kids well after they were a year old. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think they were both almost two. I mean, it wasn't all day. It was like for bedtime and for nap time by the end. So yeah. it wasn't really that they were probably even getting very much, but usually post a year, you're typically not going to see that hit and the big reason, especially after about six months to a year, is because now your baby is starting to eat. Okay. While milk supply is still considered the main nutrient up to a year of age, some kids start eating really, really well right. after six, seven, eight months. And so you may see a decrease in the amount of nursing that goes on as the baby becomes more interested in food and takes in less, um, especially the overnight. Many women, you know, might have a really great child who just sleeps all night. And so they might only nurse once or twice, maybe, or on need, you know, some women nurse on need during the day, but those, those sessions are not typically going to cause the drop in blood sugar that the early three months will cause. I want to make sure I, I didn't misunderstand something. So there, it, is it a balance between you might not be using as much and your body's becoming very good at making it? Or is the, like, at first I thought you were saying, like the same lady's body that can make an organ knows can figure out how to make milk without it being like a tax on the system. Like, is there some of that and some of the not being correct? Like, I, I, I think it's, it's a, a mix. Okay. Yeah, honestly, because for the most part, like I said, about at three to four month mark, 
I would say the women that I get to work with well past the immediate postpartum time period, they find a lot more stability Mm -hmm. in their glucose, even though they continue to nurse beyond that point, then the the lactation or the nursing sessions don't have the hit that they do initially. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Just a quick little parable while I, or while I ask you to think if there's anything that we haven't talked about, let me tell you that I was interviewing somebody recently, um, who said that they were listening. Did I interview this person or was I talking to them? doesn't matter. I was conversing with a person who said that they're pregnant now. They're listening to episodes of the podcast about pregnancy with you in them while reading the book that you wrote and did not connect that you were the person from the podcast. They didn't realize the person that wrote in the book was the person talking on the podcast. And all of a sudden it hit them one day and she was like, (laughs) oh my gosh, it's the same Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. So, that was really cute. I wanted to tell you about that. I almost just texted it to you, and I'm like, I'm going to tell her that while we're recording the postpartum episode instead. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I Yay. just thought that was really cool. Um, anything we didn't say that we should have? Oh, I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> you know, the only other thing that we didn't really touch on while it should be considered is depending on how you're feeling postpartum. I mean, most women have like this – I give you restrictions up until about six weeks post delivery when you're going to have your check in with your OB and blah, 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 and make sure everything's healing well and you're okay. And then they kind of like check you off and you can drive again, or, you know, if you've had a C section or you can get out and start running again or whatever. And I think that's a piece to consider in the mix with diabetes because, you know, we know what exercise does. So now you not only have exercise coming into the mix, but you've also got nursing coming into the mix. Mm -hmm. And, all these insulin changes that you're trying to make. So one of the big things that sort of fits here is if you have maternity time, not all women do, Mm -hmm. but if you do have maternity time, use your maternity time to try to establish sort of a route, like a routine or a schedule. And some of that's going to be dictated by the baby, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, But even regular for you, trying to get your nutrition in, timely through the course of the day. Um, you know, once nursing is a little bit more regular, the baby's wake and nursing times are more, you can fit it in around the meals and exercise is a big one of that. If you're going to start exercising, try it at a similar time of the day. So you can kind of get a feel for how does this work? You know, what can I get away with? What's too much? What's too little? Um, cause I think that just brings in the whole, like, I feel good enough to go and, you know, take a three mile run, but what's this going to (laughs) do? I don't know. Let's try. (laughs) I hear you. So it's not dissimilar to, it is interesting as you're talking about it, it really feels like postpartum's a lot like just being diagnosed, but having way more information about diabetes. Right. Like, like what if, what if somehow magically I knew the things I knew, but never had to put it into practice. And then all of a sudden there was a, a newly diagnosed person here. I'd be able to roll with the variables much right. better because I have better tools. And so you're going to go from having diabetes, maybe not doing it as well, learning how to do it really well, or already knowing how to do it well. And then it's going to feel like you're diagnosed again and you're taking care of a baby at the same time. And all your variables changed again. I'll right. tell you, I'll tell you, this is giving me a different feeling for first episode of season seven, 2021 was with a woman named Jill who was diagnosed as she got pregnant. So she was hmm. pregnant for the first time and had type one diabetes the first time. And I am now talking to you thinking I had a lot of empathy for, her. I might not have had enough, like like hearing about yeah. all this, you know, that's a whirlwind of change. Not only is she pregnant, but now she's pregnant with something. She has no background to managing and she's got to learn how to manage it through the variables of pregnancy mm-hmm. as they shift and change. Mm-hmm. I, I would imagine that postpartum was probably a lot more difficult for her than pregnancy was. I wonder, um, she's, she's, uh, active on the Facebook page. She looks like she's doing terrific. I, she actually also was misdiagnosed type two diagnosed type one. It's a fascinating story. It, it, you have to go listen to it if you haven't heard it. Um, let me. Which episode is you know, it? I'm actually going to look right now because I don't know. I've, um, I think I'm at the point now where this, I've done so many of these 
I, can't, I know you're like, I, I don't know what episode I have to look. My head. Hold on, let me look real quick. It is called, wait a minute, that was January 2021. I'm looking, why do I not see it? It would, be, it would be helpful if I knew what year it was. Now that I know what year it is, I'm, I'm getting down. It's called Wine, Beans, Babies, and Q. Oh. It's episode, Where do you come up with these names? It's episode 425. Well, she was misdiagnosed as type 2. So, you know, she still went on a wine vacation with her friends. Gotcha. Um, beans, I forget. Babies, because she was pregnant. Um, because she was told she could go. She, could, she was told she could get pregnant by a person who told her she had type 2 diabetes. And then she got pregnant as she found out she had type 1 diabetes. Ah. And a doctor with the last initial of Q set her straight. That's where all that comes from. And you you just made, I can't remember what the beans were. Damn it. It was a good episode. She's really lovely. Um, But I know her because she reached out right in that moment. Like she found the podcast and she's like, I don't know what to do. I just found out I am pregnant and I have a baby coming and I have type 1. So I was like, well, after you figure this all out and have that baby, you got to come on the podcast because it's yes. like, a hell of a story. Um, anyway, she's terrific. And and so cool. are you. Uh, we've covered this pretty well. I like this a yeah. lot. Uh, awesome. We did a little like personal chatting at the beginning, so we didn't get to do one other thing I wanted to do, but I'll just put that on my list for another okay. day. Uh, I thank you very much. I somehow find it delightful that your kids were much noisier than normal while we were talking about having a Oh, baby. and this was one child. Oh, oh, really? That was just one. Well, of them? this is just the four-year-old. The other one's at school. Mm, oh, yes. oh, oh, oh. I, I can imagine he is. So my mom came. My mom came this past weekend to visit for my birthday, mm-hmm. and um, she brought them a ring toss game, which has like it's like a wooden base, and mm-hmm. then it's got you know the things to like throw the rings over. And I'm expecting that either the whole thing was lifted up and dropped on the floor or the ring toss was being thrown from a larger distance and maybe all the rings at one time were being thrown. How much of this do you think is the part of the country you live in? Is your mother prepping them for beer pong later? Is you think that what this could be? It could be. I don't know. Who knows? I I swear to you, it felt like two adults lifted up your dining room table and dropped it from about eight inches off the ground. And the funny thing is, it was like, like you said, I didn't flinch because it was like a background. Like, I don't, it's just a background noise. <laughs> I thought, I thought I'll have to bleep myself out because here was the thought in my head. I thought, did she not f- hear that? Because <laughs> you yeah. didn't blink. It was fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, ladies, have a baby, get through all this. And one day you'll either be as good at this as Jenny or as numb as Jenny is. I'm not sure how to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fantastic. A huge thanks to the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter and Omnipod for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. You can get your free, no obligation demo of the Omnipod or find out if you're eligible for the free 30 day trial of the Omnipod Dash at myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. And of course, get yourself a meter that just flat out works. Get the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter at Contour Next dot com forward slash juice box. In just one second, I'm going to tell you how to reach Jenny and where the rest of those diabetes pro tips are at. Jenny Smith works at integrateddiabetes.com. That's all you have to do. Go to integrateddiabetes.com. Jenny does this for a living. She could actually help you in your personal life. All right. Now those diabetes pro tip episodes. They're right here in your podcast player. Like I said at the beginning, they begin at episode 210. But I've also made a list of them and put a player at diabetesprotip.com. So at diabetesprotip.com, you scroll down a little bit, and there's tons of links there to different podcast players that you can click on. And keep in mind, you should never pay for a podcast player. There are plenty of good options that are free. Or you can listen right there on the website. There's a player embedded, and it has all the episodes in a row, from 210 all the way to this one. Now, 210 is called Newly Diagnosed or Starting Over. I think these episodes are made to listen to in order, and kind of together, they coalesce very nicely. 
Then there's episode 211, 212, 217, 218 about MDI, insulin, prebolusing, and temp basaling. Then there's 219, 224, 225, 226, 231, insulin pumping, mastering your CGM, bumping and nudging, making the perfect bolus, and variables. From there, we talk about setting basal insulin, exercising with type 1 diabetes, the rise that your blood sugar may experience from fat and protein, how to handle illness, injury, and surgery, glucagon and low blood sugars, emergency room and hospital protocols, talking about your long-term health, revisiting the bumping and nudging episode. Pregnancy is in episode 364. We have one at 371 that explains type 1 diabetes to others. So if you've got a babysitter or a mother-in-law who doesn't seem to get it, just send them episode 371. Episode 379 is about the glycemic index and the glycemic load of food, which is incredibly, incredibly important whether you know it or not. And then, of course, this episode, Diabetes Pro Tip Postpartum. I think you're going to love this series. If this is your first one, go back and check out the rest. There's a little description at the top of the page, and there's even some reviews from listeners who've already listened to the Pro Tip series. Don't forget, it's 100% free, and you're not on anyone else's schedule. You don't have to be in a uh, program with a guy you found on Instagram. You don't have to be at a certain place at Tuesday night at eight o'clock. You can listen to these at your leisure and over and over again if there's something that you didn't understand. They're there for you, and I hope they help. I don't think you should have to pay someone to understand how to be healthy, and that is just one of the reasons why I've put together this Diabetes Pro Tip series. You can shut this off now, or you can hang out for a second while I read you a couple of the reviews from the site. Type 1 Tara said, through an Apple podcast review, this podcast has changed my life. I had a desire to lower my A1C and manage my blood sugars better, but was going at it blindly. Finding this podcast put everything into a tangible and practical management approach that has taken my A1C from 8.3 to 6.3 in less than six months. And that's just right now. It's going to keep coming down. It's been 1971, again through Apple Podcasts. My son was diagnosed type 1 about five months ago. I have learned so much from just the pro tip shows and will be listening to all of the episodes. This podcast is amazing, both for the information and for the shared experiences from Scott and his guests. They make you feel less like you just got hit in the face with a shovel and more like you can find ways of keeping your loved ones happy and healthy. And finally, Marty said, I saw a mention of this podcast in one of the Dexcom groups I follow on Facebook. The Pro Tip series is filled with such great information. Thank you. For someone who has been living with diabetes for 30 plus years, I wish I had been more proactive in finding this information sooner. I'm going to recommend this to my endo. I want to thank you so much for listening, for sharing the show with others, and of course, for subscribing in a podcast app. Please, please, please hit subscribe in your podcast player. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.